Um, but yeah, can you all see the screen? Yes. I'm gonna take the silent as a yes. So yes, we can see it. Yes, we can. Great. So the title of my presentation is Quantifying Traffic Congestions in Nairobi. It's a topological approach and uh, my name is Eric Boyce. Uh, this started off as a, my bachelor thesis project uh, at the uh, Royal Institute of Science and Technology here in Stockholm. Um, I did my, or I'm doing my bachelor studies in applied mathematics with a minor in industrial economics. And this whole project was a part of uh, finishing up that bachelor degree. Um, it, this project was able to be done with financial support by CEDA, which is uh, funded by the Swedish government. And um, the data used in the project was movement and open street map, which I kind of have to mention before I begin, because that was in the term and conditions of using it. And the code I'll be, or the project I'll be presenting, the code can be found online. I haven't put all it up. All, uh, all of it up there yet, but uh, some of it already is and is accessible. So the motivation behind this, as I said, I'm from Stockholm, Sweden. It's not, but the project takes place in Kenya or took place. Uh, and it all started off with me meeting uh, an African friend during my exchange studies in Switzerland. He was from Congo, Kinshasa. And he told me how bad the traffic was in Kinshasa compared to Zurich in Switzerland. And it was just crazy to hear how it could be so different in the African continent compared to the European continent. But the more I looked into it, uh, the truer it got uh, for it. And the outline I'll be having today is I'll start off with a small introduction of why this is necessary. Um, I think most of you or some of you have already uh, been to Nairobi or maybe have heard of how bad the traffic was, but I still think we have to look in for it a bit. Then we're gonna talk about the data used in the project, which was OpenStreetMap and Uber. And then finally, we're gonna go over the method I had with uh, uh, the different research questions connecting to it. And then a final conclusion, because and the key takeaways from this. Uh, so sit back, relax, and uh, hopefully we'll get the next half hour covered. Uh, we'll begin with the introduction with it. And I mean, whatever you might hear in the media, the, the world is getting better and the whole world is getting better. Where uh, countries like Ghana, India and Colombia are these emerging economies that are just growing faster than ever before. And we're seeing such a sprawling rate of econo economies in low and middle income countries, which is just wonderful to see, but <laughs> it doesn't come, uh, that easy. It has some growing pains connected to it. And if we take a look at a city like Lagos uh, in Nigeria, they saw a huge population boom because of this. I mean, the whole economy is growing, which is great, but they went in 20 years, they went from 7 million people in the city to 14 million people, which is a, it's a doubling in an already big city in just 20 years. And if we compare this to a European city, uh, for example, Stockholm, where I'm from, we went a 30% population increase in just 20 years, which is a lot smaller. And then Stockholm is still one of the fastest growing cities in on the European continent. And we already had like pretty good infrastructure built in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and the road infrastructure was already highly developed, which is the opposite of what's having uh, on the African continent. We're seeing this huge population boom at the same time that's happening faster than ever before. So what I'm getting into is that the traffic has been really bad in some of these cities, which is growing the fastest. So going into it, uh, my bachelor thesis project was connected to this. It was traffic in developing countries is increasing and it's faster than we've ever seen and that they they can't really cope with it because it's happening too fast and it's can't also turning into this catch-22 scenario where you want the economy to be growing and uh, efficient or efficiently being put to good use but it can't happen because the traffic is being such a bottleneck in the whole system you can't have a functioning city if you can't have good infrastructure behind it so it does have a both a negative economic impact and of course a negative environmental impact uh, of this. 
So the case study that I did was I went to Kenya, to Nairobi, to be at the University of Nairobi with Jared, who's helping host in this. Um, and I, I was there for a full month before Eric, could you could you unmute yourself? Oh. oh, how long was I muted for? Thirty seconds. Okay, um, yeah, but it's this. Um, we know traffic in development cities are having this pretty bad time at the moment because it's going so fast, and it's we have to fix it because otherwise. Uh, the economy is going to be growing. It's a bottleneck of the system. So how do we fix traffic? Well, we have limited resources, so we kind of have to be efficient about it. But to be efficient, we kind of need to know when things are getting better. We have to be measuring traffic to have a good sense. To know that resources are being put to good use, we need to have a feedback loop within the system, that knowing that what we did was efficient and that we want to do more of that, or we know that that thing didn't help. I mean, how do we know that fixing a road? It feels better. A lot of people have an emotional connection to traffic because it's something that we have to deal with every day, just traveling within the city. And you know, traffic today was so bad, but do you know it? I mean, do we have a good measuring system? Um, what's kind of unfortunate is that there's not too many good methods uh, to be dealt with. A lot of, if you look at the European continent, a lot of the cities have, have invested huge sums of money into traffic ca cameras and the traffic institutions have spent a lot of money just getting a system to run with this while developing cities don't have these resources so we kind of have want to have something that's efficient and low cost to be able to deal with this resource uh, problem so this was formulated into three research questions because this is, was an academic report and the first one was can the method be applied to traffic networks in urbanized developing cities because what we wanted to begin with was just finding a method that could work that gives qualitative insight that traffic institutions can use and uh, um, have a better feeling about the traffic and not be put the emotional senses of it uh, and also can the traffic method differentiate does it work do we know that traffic today was better than traffic tomorrow and can the method that we worked out with the data actually tell that um, and then that turned into the final research question which was can the method be used to detect advancements can we use the method that we were able to come up with or is going to present to actually notice things are getting better money is being put to good use um, so we had to let, take a look at the data available as i said we these cities that uh i wanted the method to work for for uh, they don't have traffic cameras in the same way because that costs a lot of money. If you look at Beijing, uh, the capital of China, they have put an enormous resources to just understand where all the all the cars in the traffic systems are, and it works out great. They can uh, be they can optimize traffic lights in every intersection to adapt, but this isn't doable for the cities we want to look at. So what we found was OpenStreetMap, which is to map the city so we know what, where things are. So we took a look at Nairobi. Uh, OpenStreetMap is a public, publicly available data source that gives you, um, we could find all the intersections of the city, which we call nodes, which is every intersections in the traffic, uh, in the city that the traffic uses and also the position of that node. Uh, but the most useful thing was Uber movement. So I think you all are familiar with Uber, which is the taxi service that's provided by Uber Technologies, an American company. Uh, there's similar services like Bolt or Volt in other cities, but Uber Movement just has a bunch of traffic cars in the city. And what these traffic cars, uh, since they travel the road and since they all have a GPS to be able to track all the cars, they have all the speed data between intersections. So they have this service called Uber Movement where they publicly offer the, the tracked speed or the measured speed between all intersections of a city. And they have it for Nairobi. So what we were able to get down from Uber Movement was 
all the intersections or all the nodes of the traffic uh, or the city um, at the speed that they had recorded. And they had this for the last two years, uh, all the months of the year and all the days of that month and even down to the hour. So we could separate the speed of Nairobi hour by hour for the full year and look at different um, different states of the traffic network. Uh, so hourly, this so is the average speed? It's the average speed. They also had, because um, they want to filter out uh, most of it, they don't want to have, you can't get the speed of a single car because they want to have anonymous data. So they aggregate the data in a sense that they only give you the average. And there's, uh, they also give you the standard deviation of that, which was uh, mostly pretty small. And sometimes they didn't give you for all the nodes because they didn't have enough cars within that for that hour. So it's not perfect data, but you have a lot of data for it. But yeah, it's an average of it. So this is what turned out to be used in the method that we developed. Um, we used, uh, I'm not gonna go over all the definitions used, but I want still you to realize that there is a lot of mathematical rigorness behind this. But since this is a presentation and I'm not a academic report, I'll try to keep the explanations a bit more uh, understandable. So it's not just math being thrown at you. And we'll go over research question by research question. And for the first one to develop so that the method can give qualitative insight for the report, we turn to barcodes, which is, um, it's a tool from the field of topological uh, data analysis uh, within applied mathematics. And it's about looking at structures uh, within the point spaces. So imagine a point space with just points in space. They have some sort of a distance in between them. And we wanna get a sense of topological features. We might wanna study clusters or if there's holes in the point space or other underlying structures of it. And uh, a pretty simple thing for this is to take some distance D, that's the distance between all the points and then draw the lines in between the nodes for that. Then you can get kind of a sense for clusters. But the problem here is which D or which distance do you pick? Because depending on the distance you pick, you're gonna see different topological features. Imagine if we would pick a very long distance to uh, draw lines in between, we're gonna see uh, everything being one cluster with one hole in it. Um, but if we pick a much smaller D, then we're not gonna see these features. So what distance do you pick? And this is where barcodes come in instead of this. Barcodes allow you to st study point spaces um, without needing to pick a single distance. So in traffic, we wanna look for clusters of small roads. Um, remember that we had intersections and we had the speed in between those intersections. And what is traffic? Well, it's you driving slow on a road and it's kind of you driving slow on multiple roads in a, in a row. Um, traffic congestions are just clusters of sm slow roads within a traffic network. So a barcode studies this. Uh, take, for example, this very small uh, point space with only four dots. And then let's vary the distance D that we'll look in between by making these uh, ball formations surrounding them. And every time a cluster appears, we start drawing a bar in the barcode. So I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but I think you can. For when we go to this small distance D, I'll, uh, one of the smaller clusters up here, and that's drawn in with a line. And then when we go to D2, we get this other cluster here to the left, and then we start drawing the second line. But at D3, at that longer distance, it all comes down into one big cluster. And then that's when we kill um, one of the clusters and just keep drawing um, the first one. And you can even do this for more advanced stuff. Uh, if you take a bigger point space and still alter this distance D and have these balls growing around them and clusters appears as they fall in together, um, turns out very nicely. Uh, let's see if this animation still can finish up. And um, what you get is a whole bunch of bars in the barcode. And each bar uh, looks at a, is a different topological feature. Longer bars are strong topological features that appear for a longer distance D. And it turns out that these small bars are noise in the data. 
that you can filter out and just appeared for a very short amount of time because they don't really have an underlying structure or they don't really mean anything to the final result. So we did this. We did a barcode for the whole city of Nairobi. And this is what we got as the animation place. This is downtown Nairobi for you who've been there. Um, it's a very crowded place with a lot of roads and we could filter this. The distance metric that we look at is just the speed, the average speed for different times of day. And I think this is aggregated data for the whole month of March that we're looking at. And what you see is this, in the barcode, you definitely have longer bars, which each of the longer bars corresponds to a different cluster. And you can see a main cluster down here in the, kind of in the middle of the city where cars are going the absolute slowest, which is, that's where you have like the heart of the traffic. And then as you go out to other parts of the city, you can see that the main roads are yellow, which is just, they're going a bit faster. And then the uh, roads out to the uh, outskirts are even uh, a bit slower. So we're getting some qualitative sense here. We know where the traffic is or like where the main traffic can be found, uh, which is great, uh, but it's not the end result. Um, we can see some features of the traffic thanks to the, these barcodes, but it's not everything. It gives qualitative insight, but it can't be used to compare. That's the main problem with barcodes is that you can't compare different barcodes easily, especially when the underlying data differs a lot because the data that Uber was uh, or gave us, it differs a lot from week to week and you're not getting the same picture of the traffic because they don't have data between all the intersections all the time just because cars weren't going uh, in that place that day. So what we turn to for uh, question number two is a bit different. We wanna extend the method to be able to differentiate between levels of traffic congestions to know that the level at this time was different from the level at that time. And for this, we turn to signatures, which are very close to barcodes, but they can be compared to one another. And they have some variances, which is great for statistics, because we want to have, we don't want to be sure that what we're looking at really is different. So a signature is, uh, it's, you start off with a barcode, but you redefine the topological feature you're looking at, so you know it's going to be the feature feature will be alive from the very beginning for even small distances, and then you know that the features will die off as you increase that distance metric uh, metric, and the signature of this is just drawing a line following the death of each barcode, and this just turns out to be one single function that or a piecewise constant always decreasing function, which is great because these have means and you can sample them. Uh, which is kind of the question we turn into because we want to compare uh, levels of traffic. And for this, we, uh, we don't know like what's different traffic levels. We are kind of coming up with a method from nothing. But what we assumed was that if we look at the whole month of March, we should be able to sample every weekday, uh, every the same hour for all the weekdays should have kind of the same traffic. And what I'm saying here is that the traffic at eight o'clock in the morning should be about the same every eight o'clock morning for all weekdays in all of March. Uh, but if we compare it to 12 o'clock in the day, that should be different. So we sample eight o'clock and we compare it to 12 o'clock and then we compare that to 16 o'clock or four in the afternoon. And that should be different states of the network. Uh, so we can look at the signatures that we were able to find here. Well, this is just signatures for 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, downtown Nairobi, all, of, all weekdays of March. And you get these signature lines for every day that kind of are close to each other. They look to be drawn from the same point space with some small variations in the underlying of it. Uh, and we turn, we can sub, or we can look at the mean um, and we can look at the like 95% variance uh, of these um, signatures drawn. And then we can extend this to look at more hours. So we looked at two in the night, six in the morning, 10 in the morning, and then four in the afternoon. And we can see that these lie at different places um, 
in the signature, which is great because that kind of gives us the sense that these are different and that traffic at different times are different for it. Uh, but to compare this, um, we kind of have to extend it. We want to prove statistically that these signatures are different from each other, depending on the hour. So we go to a principal component analysis and then perform a t-test on the first principal component. I think most of you know what a principal component analysis is, but it's mostly just reducing the whole function to a single, uh, to a single dimension so that each signature falls down and lies on, on one dimension or gives you one number. And then we can use a t-test to compare different samples of these. So what we look at the t-test is that we compare is 12 in the night different from two in the morning. If we sample all of March, is it statistically different? Is that group of the network statistically different from two o'clock in the morning? And it turned out it was with a 5% p-value. Uh, we could uh, throw away the null hypothesis. And then we compared, is 12 at night different from all other day, days of the day? So is the traffic at 12 at night different from the traffic at all different times of the day? And it turned out it was. We could statistically prove that uh, it looks to be drawn from, or we couldn't throw away the null hypothesis that they weren't. And then we kind of compare every hour of the day with every other hour. So it's like a piecewise thing where we compare eight in the morning to all other days or all other hours of the day and we for the most part we were able to prove that the the traffic network seems to be different for different hours of the day but the problem was that uh, you can see in this matrix that 10 o'clock is not easily comparable uh, to two o'clock and to six o'clock and that 12 o'clock to 16. so like this whole afternoon of hours we couldn't really see a difference in the traffic which is probably true because the traffic in the afternoon is probably about the same and that the hours that we're trying or testing against aren't that different. And also we noticed that there was a very high variance which makes these t-tests a bit less uh, reliable. And that's just saying that if you look at 12 o'clock in the day for all of March, there's a high variance in how the traffic is gonna be, which could be true. It, there's probably a lot of other factors depending in on it and not just the hour of the day. Um, so that turned into the last research question. Can these methods be used to detect the road advancement? So for this, we talked to a traffic engineer in the city uh, who had put up street lights in a couple of intersections in Nairobi. And we could test if signatures before, in the whole year before he put up the uh, traffic light, uh, compared to the whole year after he put off the traffic light. And the answer behind it was maybe. Uh, we couldn't really see a big difference in the, uh, in the signatures, unfortunately. Actually, we, what we detected was more towards that the traffic the year after the traffic lights has been uh, installed, that it was worse. Traffic had gotten worse uh, 2018 compared to 2019, which is probably true because there's more cars on the road and there's more things happening, more factors playing into it. And the traffic lights didn't really make that much of a difference. So, and this is unfortunately where the whole method stops, um, which leads us into the discussion of this. Were we able to answer all the research question? Maybe. We could check for barcodes and we could give qualitative insight in the city. This using uh, methods from the field of topological data analysis prove to give some qualitative insight of the city. We can kind of see where traffic originates and where there's more traffic and where there's less traffic. And we can, we know that the method can differentiate between traffic. But when you try to use it in practice and compare if a traffic light actually uh, helps uh, for a neighborhood or that the traffic is actually lower after you install a traffic light? Unsure. And this is probably not something we expected to know for sure because a traffic light doesn't do that much of a difference. We kind of have to look at larger road infrastructures and we kind of have to look at larger periods of time to compare uh, to actually know anything. Which will, this, the data we had from Uber was not, it was only two years of data. They haven't been operating in Nairobi for that long. But 10 years from now, if we have data for a whole decade, it would probably 
can use these methods uh, to give some sense that the traffic is getting better or the traffic is getting worse. Um, and with that, the key take takeaways from this presentation is that these developing cities, they can leapfrog and they're, they're gonna be growing faster and there's no stopping that. And we can actually put technology into good use because all of these Uber drivers is recording things. And these smart cities is, are using data from the, what people are doing. And hopefully we can put the, this into traffic institutions so they can do something with it. And the uh, other takeaway is that topic, topological data analysis does give insight for traffic data networks and it does make sense. It would be nice to study this for different cities which haven't been done, but we'll get there. Uh, so I wanna thank you for listening in. Um, my name is Eric Boyce and this was the, uh, what uh, I did for my bachelor's thesis to, um, to finish up my degree in uh, applied mathematics at KTH. Thank you. Uh, I wanna open up for questions if there's anything. Uh, regarding it. Uh, you can just type them or speak up. So if I have a question. The signatures that you showed, that you considered, they were only H0 or also H1? The first it was one. only H, it was only H0. So that's a betting number that uh, Wojtek asked about for you who know it. And we only studied zero betting numbers. I, I think I looked into, I couldn't find any H1 the numbers within the data. Maybe I saw some for like uh, some days or some different states of the traffic network, but it was never something that was consistent. Uh, and then I could find repeatedly over time. So that didn't turn out for much. Uh, now, another, I have a following up question. So another, uh, another, uh, you, you look at the global data, you look at this whole data for entire Nairobi, yeah. And then you no, uh, no. We mostly just look in the uh, for different neighborhoods. We were like they have different boroughs or different parts of the city that you can separate between, thanks okay. to OpenStreetMap. So we but never looked also, at the whole city. Yeah. But you could also make it, you know, node-wise. Uh, you could perform these uh, averages for each node separately. Yeah. And you, it would uh, be right. Uh, you should be able to look like surrounding for one node. You should see the surrounding and how it connects to other nodes. That would be possible. Yeah. yeah right. Uh, but that was uh, the problem with OpenStreetMap. The data source is that it's not that um, it's not that nice to work with. You're having a lot of problems just filtering out the data, and just being able to look at a small uh, part of the city was difficult enough. And try to. Um, the tool you draw that data from wasn't that nice. Okay. Right. Yes, Patrick has a question. Please go ahead. I, I, I hope I have now unmuted. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Eric. Uh, we met in Nairobi and it's good to listen to you. And I'm happy that uh, you and Jared worked out something uh, because you were here just before COVID-19 started. Yeah. And I think for me, I got worried because uh, I, I thought you'd be stuck mm -hmm. in, uh, in Nairobi when everyone is sent to go and stay at home. I thought you'd be stuck somewhere, but I'm happy you are safe and you finished your project and graduated. Congratulations. Thank you. Two, yeah, it was very close there. Yeah, two questions, one technical, one general. I should start with a general one. So when you talk about traffic network, traffic flows in Nairobi, and you visited the University of Nairobi, I know there's a lot of work that uh, groups have done on this uh, from um, engineering and one remarkable one is from the school of computing and informatics looking at the traffic hey, flows in Nairobi and developing yeah, even an, an app 
uh, did you get a chance to to look at what they have done in order to no unfortunately i wasn't able to i think the uh, i know the app that you were talking about and it works a bit with the buses and the matatus yes, and some yes, of the yes. yeah no mm. unfortunately not and that was a bit of a problem with that happened with uh, covid19 that uh, wow. i was only in nairobi for a month and i was planning on being there a whole month longer um, to <laughs> talk with the traffic institute but that all closed down when um, corona hit and I had to travel back home. So I never actually had an a chance to speak with the Traffic Institute to see what data they had. Uh, it was a very unfortunate, but I had booked the meeting the week after they all closed down. Okay. In the following okay. week. So. And uh, the data that the uh, School of Computing has, which uh, I think that was related to uh, just traffic lights. They When they install the traffic lights, they also installed a camera looking at the traffic. So it's very selected points within the city. While this method, it looks at the whole city, even the smaller streets. It basically just looks at any street that a car is able to drive into and that people use Uber with. So it's a bit more mm -hmm. big data sense that you get a whole bunch more data and which get, uh, or it calls for better methods than uh, just counting cars. Okay, now the the next one is uh, I have seen that you have used uh, a PCA, yeah, and from and from the PCA you are able to do a statistical test uh, to look at the you know significance of uh, yeah. uh, the, the 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 hypothesis that you are testing, um, and that is using the t test. Now the table or the triangle that you have displayed has the ticks and the excess. Um, I, I would be interested to, to know the exact values. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, rather than the ticks, of course, I know that you can use these ticks and excess to test using a t-test if you assume a distribution-free or a non-parametric method. But would, would these ticks and X's have actual values uh, yeah, so, so that we, we are able to see the, the correlation uh, between the, the times indicated? Yeah, you, I mean, you can use the t-test to get the exact, exact p-value, but uh, I still want to say I don't think that doing a PCA on the signatures was the best solution to it. I would, it would be better to find some other solutions than using the PCA. Um, what I did, I mean, you, to answer, I think I'm going to be answering your question with saying that you can get the exact p-value. And what I, these ticks that I drew out were just if it's under 5% or if it's higher than 5%. Like, throw away the null hypothesis if it doesn't have a p-value lower than it. And um, you definitely see it's not perfect. Uh, at all. And most of the p-values were around 4% for it. Uh, and it, that's, again, the problem with you don't have that much data. You, there's only about 15 weekdays, which, again, it mentions the problem with is it or what does the d distribution look? Does the, uh, does the mean go towards a uh, normal distribution? And it probably doesn't, but I wasn't able to look at that because I just didn't have enough data for it. But you can't look at more data because then you have to look at multiple months. And then you're going to have even more problems with eight o'clock in April and March and May are not the same. But so you want to look at a small time span, but you still want to have a lot of data. But there's only so many mornings in all of March, which have about the same. Um, it's difficult. I mean, I think you can make better assumptions about the uh, how traffic works. But as someone who's just been driving in traffic and not much more, I just have a, a emotional sense that I know traffic uh, eight in the morning is different from ten in the morning, which is probably not true of it. Super. Thank you very much. Anything else? Or anyone else having? 
if not, I want to thank you. And uh, thanks, Jared, so much for uh, allowing it. It was you who helped me with all of this and uh, was able to set up all the contacts uh, with the University of Nairobi to make it all happen. So I can't thank the University of Nairobi enough uh, for it to be made possible. Thank you.